Welcome back to Trendlines Over Headlines, the show where we break down the markets with some of the best traders and analysts out there. My name is Patrick Dunawilla. I'm the editor of The Chart Report, and I'll be your host. We've got a real treat for you today. Walter Diemer is going to be joining us. If you don't know Walter, he's a real legend in our industry. He's retired now, but he started his career back in 1963 at Merrill Lynch and spent 55 years working as a technical analyst for some of the biggest money managers of that era. He's seen more market cycles than just about any of us, so he's got a ton of wisdom to share. We're really lucky to have him. But before we talk to Walter, it's Friday, the markets are closed, so let's take a quick look at how this week played out. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Just a quick reminder, be sure to click like and subscribe so we can continue bringing you awesome content. Thanks. All right, so stocks continued to rebound this week. All four major indices closed higher. The Russell 2000 led, rising more than 6%. The Nasdaq lagged thanks to some of those ugly mega cap tech earnings. Uh, but overall, it still gained about 2% on the week. The Dow has risen for four consecutive weeks now, which is the longest winning streak it's had in about a year. It actually reclaimed its 200-day moving average today. It's been rejected there four times already this year, so we'll see if the fifth time is the charm. Uh, moving on to the S&P 500, it's still about 4 or 5% below its 200-day moving average. However, it did reclaim its 50-day moving average this week, and it's above those June lows, so definitely some constructive action at the index level this week. Moving on to the sector performance, industrials led gaining more than 6.5%. Now, Meta and Google really weighed on the communications sector this week. As you can see, it was the only sector that closed lower, dropping about 2%. Anyways, that's enough from me. Let's welcome Walter onto the show. All right, Walter, welcome to the show. Thank you for joining us today, and it's an honor to have you on. Honored to be here, Patrick. You, uh, you, you do a tremendous service with the chart report, and I appreciate it very much. Oh, that's extremely humbling coming from you. You know, I'm, I've been a huge fan of your work for a while now, uh, so it's a real privilege to be able to sit here and, and talk to you. Anyway, when I invited you onto the show, you said, you know, I'm retired now. I don't follow the markets as closely as I used to. So I don't want to talk about where the market's headed next week or next month like we usually do on this show. Um, so you said I'd rather kind of approach the conversation from a historical behavioral point of view. And I think that's a great idea. So we're going to spend a lot of time talking about the late 60s and early 70s, a period uh, in market history, which was really interesting. You were there for it. I certainly wasn't, uh, so forgive me if I ask a bunch of, uh, you know, dumb questions. Um, but yeah, I think we'll, we'll let our viewers draw their own parallels between that period and today's market. But before we get into that market stuff, could you just give us a little bit more background on you, starting from how did you even get into markets and technical analysis in the first place? Well, I was interested in the stock market as a kid, and that uh, uh, when I went to I went to Penn State, um, there was one brokerage office in town. I was at Penn State uh, in 1961, 62, and there was a little unpleasantness called the crash of 1962. Two of the brokers had technical backgrounds and seen it coming mile away. You had a huge breadth divergence and stuff like that, and I was impressed. And that uh, I also uh, one day took Joe Granville's book out of the Penn State Library, The Daily Strategy for uh, Stock Market Profits. And Joe Granville is a rather uh, persuasive writer, colorful writer. And so I kind of got hooked on technical analysis. I started keeping charts, uh, indicators and stuff, and I started following the market then. Uh, went to work for uh, Merrill Lynch as a research trainee in 63. Uh, in 1964, I moved into the market analysis department, which is uh, Bob Farrell's legendary uh, uh, group. Uh, in 1966, I went on to work for Jerry Sy, which uh, was the uh, Manhattan Fund, which was the heart of the go-go years. 
uh, very speculative, the, which is, that was the era of performance. Uh, in 1970, I went to Putnam. I, was, I ran their market analysis department for, uh, and I was also uh, in the later years on their investment policy committee. And by 1980, I had a tough of corporate America and I struck out on my own, uh, did consulting work uh, on you know, market strategies for institutional clients until I finally totally retired at the end of 2016. Now I follow the market for amusement because I hate to tell you, Patrick, but once you do this, it never goes away. You're going to be doing this. And, you know, the last, you know, the last, you know, with your, your dying breath, you're going to ask, you know, what was the S&P? What's the S&P doing right now? <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't ever want to lose uh, interest either, but, you know, 55 years, what an impressive career and working alongside some of the greats like Bob Farrell and, and Gerald Tsai, and we'll talk about that later. Um, but yeah, I can, I can only hope to have as impressive of a career as you've had. Um, but, you know, one of the things I admire the most about you, Walter, is, is your witty market sayings, you know, these quips and quotes that you have. Uh, one of my favorites and, and one of your most famous is, of course, when the time comes to buy, you won't want to. It's also the title of your book to our viewers. I highly recommend checking it out. It's like 12 bucks on Amazon. So definitely go take a look, order your copy after this. Um, but I know you have a great story behind that phrase, when the time comes to buy, you won't want to. And I think it's brilliant. I mean, in one sentence, it really sums up so much about investor behavior. You know, so many times our emotions are telling us to do the opposite of what's prudent, right? Um, so tell us that story of, of where the phrase came from. Okay, well, it, it started out when I worked for Jerry Sai, he, his, his attention span was approximately five seconds. So I learned to uh, make my point very quickly. And then if you wanted any clarification, go on. When I went to Putnam, I was still doing that. And the fund managers were all out of the Harvard Business School. So I had to you know, speak very basically to them because they didn't understand how the real world operated. And that uh, a stock is not the same as a company. And then, you know, little things like that. And so one day, the uh, one time the market is, uh, we're, we're in a bull market, but we were, were getting an intermediate correction in the bull market. As soon as it goes down, the fund managers come into my office because they're always bullish. And they say, is it time to buy yet? I said, no. Next day, they came in again. The market went down a little more. Is it time to buy yet? And they said, no. And next day, the market went down a little more. They came into my office and they said, is it time to buy yet? And I said, no. And finally, I got tired of all this. And I finally told them when the time comes to buy, you won't want to. The reason being that by the time the market finally bottoms, the media is full of all the reasons why it went down. We all know it. We're obsessed with it. And emotionally, that uh, you know, there's nothing but mad, bad news out there. I mean, go back to the COVID bottom in 2020. The, the world was on lockdown, and you know, the economy was it was imploding. Nobody was going on an airplane. Nobody was doing anything, and that was the time to buy. And the, the headlines were horrendous. So I don't think the day of the bottom. I will guarantee you, nobody was running around saying, "This is it. This is a great buying opportunity. We're going to go." straight up for another year and a half. They weren't saying that. Yeah, I mean, you could have said that a million times, and I'm sure you probably did this year, right? You know, there, there, it seemed like every decline, people were really searching for the bottom because for the last, you know, for years, that's been the move, you know, buy the dip, right? And, <laughs> you know, the dip kept dipping. Um, and on each kind of successive dip, I think the enthusiasm to rush in and buy got less and less and less, you know, to the point where, you know, at the most recent low, nobody really wanted to pick the bottom kind of thing. Um, I don't know if it's the low or just a low. That's kind of beside the point. But I want to move on to the market stuff. We're going to be specifically talking about those late 60s and early 70s period. And it's interesting, you know, if you look at a chart of the Dow Jones during that period, you know, pretty much from what, 1966 to 1983, 16 years, the Dow and S&P kind of just went sideways for that period. Uh, but the Dow doesn't really accurately reflect what was going on in that period. You know, there were a lot of speculative booms and busts that you're going to talk about. Um, 
and you had plenty of, of kind of bull and bear markets within it. Um, so, you know, let's start with the go-go years. What, what was the go-go years really? And, and, and what, when did it kind of occur? Go-go years were in the late 60s that uh, Jerry Sy kind of invented performance investing in 1965, uh, where that instead of buying stocks and holding them forever, he was aggressively trading them and aggressively looking for, uh, you know, uh, big winners. And a whole host of people started uh, doing that, and the market got more and more speculative. And it ended up uh, with what has been called the go-go years, because uh, the, the story goes that one of the uh, brokerage houses in New York, that people would come into the boardroom that they had back in those days, and as their favorite stocks traded across the tape, tape they would chant, go, go, go. So, And also there were the go-go girls that uh, you know, emphasize, you know, uh, uh, illustrated the period. So it was a very speculative time. Uh, the... Uh, Trading got extremely active. The uh, New York Stock Exchange had to close on Wednesdays, uh, starting in 1969 for a while. The American Stock Exchange, which no longer exists, uh, but was uh, the, the, a very small part of the financial world, but where the speculative stocks lived, the tape at one point ran 37 minutes late. And could I you, remember- you know, Could you explain out. what you mean by that, that the tape ran late? I mean, well, that doesn't really happen anymore, well, right? No. Well, back in the day, the ticker used to report every transaction so that if um, things got active, the, the, the ticker would be running behind the actual transactions. By the time the trade took, took, between the time the trade took place on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange and the time it was printed on the tape, sometimes there were delays. The uh, most famous time was the biggest reversal in uh, uh, one of the biggest reversals in market history, which was May 29th, 1962, when everything, the market had crashed the day before, everything opened way down. And then about uh, 1130 in the morning, they started rallying and they rallied for the rest of the day. Uh, back in those days, the uh, market closed at 330 and the tape, the ticker kept, uh, the tape kept running until after eight o'clock. Wow. So, you know, people literally didn't know what was going on. Now, the American Stock Exchange didn't have that much activity, but, you know, still in the 19, late 1960s, there, were, there was a time when even that tape ran 37 minutes late. And that was just due to the sheer volume, right? Sheer volume, yeah. yeah. So the, the offices couldn't handle the bottom, but the volume and the, the stock exchange actually closed on Wednesdays for I don't know how many, uh, how many months, and then they it started uh, reopening, but they would close early. They would close at 2.30 2 in the afternoon and then 3 in the afternoon. And they finally went back to 3.30 in the afternoon, which is when it closed in those days. So what was, what was kind of leadership like at that time? And, and how did it kind of shift during those go-go years? During the go-go years, it was the most speculative junk you could find. It was nursing homes. It was forced. You can't find charts of these things. They don't exist anymore. Oh, it I was, tried. It, it was gambling stocks. Uh, uh, gambling stocks were a big one. Uh, nursing homes, uh, fried chicken franchises uh, were, were a big one. Uh, electronics were a big one. You know, technology was a big one. Uh, unfortunately, the, the uh, companies that were, were the speculative favorites don't exist anymore. So you can't see a long-term chart. Long-term chart is zero. And, and how did that period kind of come to an end? Was it kind of just slowly or did it kind of just morph into that? Uh, what we're going to talk about next, which is the nifty 50 high flying growth stocks, um, you know, that was kind of defined by more institutional speculation, whereas the go-go years were what was it kind of retail, a retail, retail renaissance? Spe retail speculation and some institutional speculation from the, from the aggressive performance mutual fund. I see. Which would, which would be the, anal the, 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 the analogy to that would be hedge funds today. I see. I see. Well, you had asked how it ended and it ended. The Federal Reserve killed it in the middle of 1969. Uh, William McChesney Martin, who was then the chair of the chairman of the Federal Reserve, said, you know, this inflation thing we've got is a real problem. And we're going to we're going to take steps to 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 tame it, get it back to normal. 
And unfortunately, the actions we take are going to cause pain and suffering before we are done. And that word pain stuck with me uh, because if you look at a chart of the market from the middle of 1969 to the middle of 1970, it was a huge bear market. The Federal Reserve got their wish. They caught, they, 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 uh, they, what they, 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 cur they curbed uh, economic activity. They curbed speculation. They got their way, and the market eventually went down. And that's what, that's what put the end to the 1968-69 or the bull market that uh, ended in 68-69. And I found it interesting because Jay Powell, the current head of the Fed, uh, came out back. I think it was in April that he said that you know this inflation thing. It's not transitory after all. Uh, it's more deep seated. We're going to take care of it, but we're going to. There's going to be some pain before we're done. And all of a sudden, pain. The Chesney Martin, middle of 1969, pain. Jay Powell, you know, April of 19, 2022. Uh, yeah, it wow. struck so, a chord. So the yep. Fed literally told you back then we're going to squash this speculative fever kind of thing, and and they did. That was kind of what ultimately killed the go-go years? That's what killed it. So, and then ultimately the bad performance because these turkeys didn't have anything to support them so that the stocks that went from you know, 20 to 100 went back to 20 again. So let's talk about that next period, the, the rise and fall of these nifty 50 stocks, as they were called. And not to be confused with India's nifty 50, which is right. kind of like their Dow or their um, major index, what were the Nifty 50 stocks? Because it wasn't really an index. You know, I've tried to find charts of it, and it, it's not really an index. It was more just a, a term to describe these high-flying growth stocks. Is that right? Yeah, it, it was. Uh, we did we did a screen that uh, 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 well, one of the financial publications ran a screen, uh, and the qualifications were that they had to have uh, 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 they had to have a billion dollars in market capitalization. Uh, in those days. That was a big number. Nowadays, everybody's got a billion dollars in market. They had to, so they had to be big. And they had to have a growth rate of, I think it was 10% you know, per year or something like that compounded. But more importantly, if you drew a least squares trend line around the uh, earnings, it couldn't deviate by much from that least squares trend line. So it was straight line growth, uh, mostly the consumer growth stocks, but things like McDonald's, uh, Johnson & Johnson, Avon Products. Uh, Baxter Labs, um, IBM, uh, Polaroid, Xerox, stuff like that. They were they were very high quality companies. And let me just say, before we leave the uh, go go years, that you know there's an analogy you can draw between the speculative stocks in the late '60s and the Ark stocks, the Kathy Wood stocks, uh, in this this time go around where they peaked, you know, a year and a half ago, uh, with obvious excesses. Uh, and it was sort of there's a parallel between the, uh, the between the uh, go-go years, the, the very speculative stocks, and Kathy Wood's very speculative stocks a year and a half ago. Okay, moving forward, when the speculative stocks cratered in 1970, and we came and we came back, we had high inflation, we had high uh, uh, interest rates, and people were looking for the most best quality, highest, strongest, highest quality, strongest companies in the world. And they turned out to be mostly consumer growth stocks. There were some cyclical growth stocks in there. And there were something like 50 of them. And so they became the nifty 50. And they also became known as one decision stocks because the only decision you ever had to make was to buy them. Never sold them. Never a reason to sell them. And the analogy there is, you know, the FANG stocks earlier this year where people were, you know, buying them, that they were the strongest, best growing, biggest companies uh, forever. But you know, there's a limit as to how much you pay for these things. There was back in the 1970s, and there, you know, it turned out there was for the fangs too. Yeah, so that's interesting. So those really speculative stocks that were the leaders during the go-go years in the late 60s, those were more like your archetype stocks. You can kind of think of them like that. Um, and then the Nifty 50 were more like large cap, almost like more like fang to, uh, to compare it to this market environment. But it sounds like it made sense why people liked these stocks. I mean, they were large cap household names 
businesses that people understood kind of like the FANG stocks today. Um, they were growing earnings at a crazy clip. They'd outperformed the broader market for years. And as you said, they were one decision stocks, kind of like you know, how Facebook, Apple, Amazon, um, Netflix, you know, maybe not today, but two years ago were being talked about as just, just buy them. You know, just, it's yeah. a no brainer kind of thing, right? Yeah, exactly. And, but the, the thing is, it was reflected in the prices of, of the stock. McDonald's was one of the uh, leading things. And it went from a low in 1970 of $10 a share. Uh, it hit uh, 77 in uh, uh, 1973. So the problem is everybody looks at the chart of the averages at the hour the Sir Porter sees it going sideways. But the average stock, the, the, uh, the old go-go stocks, basically had a huge decline, and then they had less than a 50% retracement of that decline in 71, 72. The Nifty 50 were going up like gangbusters. There were, weren't many of them, but they were heavily weighted. So the, the averages showed something in between the disastrous performance of the small stocks and the sensational performance of a limited number of big stocks which is the same thing that happened with the fangs distorting things earlier this year. Yeah, and I think it's important to keep in mind that, you know, McDonald's, that's in the Dow today, but it wasn't back then. And to your point, that's why you pull up a chart of the Dow and it doesn't really show any of that um, in, in the Dow, right? Correct, exactly. That's what that was the problem with the Dow. And, you know, was, I have it a- somewhere. It was somewhere in the middle. No stock was doing what the Dow did. They were either doing a lot worse, like the go-go stocks, or a lot better, like the Nifty 50. But nothing was doing like the Dow was. I used to tell people, it's like looking out the window in Boston, there's a sailboat in Boston Harbor. You know, you can see which direction the sailboat is going, which was the the market averages. But you don't know how much the wind was pushing it in one direction and the tide was pulling it in another direction. You you know, you couldn't tell that from the direction of the sailboat or you knew the ultimate result. And that's what the averages were. So the averages were totally misleading. I, I like that analogy. And, you know, here I have, you know, I, I marked up some charts myself. You know, like you were saying, it's, it's hard to find charts on these things because some of these companies are extinct now. Polaroid, stuff like that. Kodak. Um, well, I guess Kodak's a, a different story. But, um, you know, McDonald's, right? IPO'd around 67, 68, 1967, 1968, ran almost 1,000% up until 1973, and then 72% decline. And then it didn't go anywhere for, for 10 years, right? And, and it's not alone. I mean, pretty much that whole group. Here we have Disney, right? 1,000% rise in just a couple of years, uh, then 84% decline, and nowhere for 12 years. And, and just to reiterate the point, Johnson & Johnson, 400% rise up until 1973, 50%, you know, cut in half, and then nowhere for until the, the early 80s. Yeah, and if anybody is really interested, I, I, I just, I, when, I, when I moved into a, a senior living facility, um, I moved from a 3,300-square-foot house to an 1,100-foot apartment. So. Uh, all my reports that I had done over the years were in 49 loose leaf, lo- lo- loose leaf notebooks in a file drawer, and I couldn't take them with me. So I had them scanned, and that, uh, they were all on a little hard drive. And then uh, uh, Tony DeBell's family, uh, who was a leading market technician back then, uh, put all their market letters on a website. So I said, well, I've already had them scanned. I can put them on a website. So if you go to deemermarketmemos.com, uh, you can find all the memos that I wrote, or many of the memos that I wrote back in the 70s, along with charts of the growth stocks. What did, we had our growth stock average. We had a consumer growth stock average. We had a cyclical growth stock average. We had regular growth stock average. We had a lot of, there are a lot of charts in there. And you can just go on there and look. And I, I will tell you, do, do not tell me that, you know, some of the reports are tar- very embarrassing. I know all about them. Some of them are go Okay. But some of them are horribly embarrassing, but that's what we did at the time. And, you know, we had a lot of charts in the reports. So you can go back and see contemporary charts of a lot of stocks back in those days. 
Yeah, I didn't even know that you had that website of your archives. I think that's such a valuable thing. It's it's deemersmarketmemos.com, right? De- Deemer singular, deemermarketmemos.com. Got it. We'll put it up at the bottom here too. But my next question is, what was it like being a technical analyst during that period? I mean, were, were you making these charts by hand? Were you ordering them through that Mansfield chart service? I mean, what what was that like? Was it still, you know, looked down upon to be a technician? You no, know, in the old days, we made charts by hand. Uh, there were no computers in those days. Uh, we were just starting with computers. Uh, so we had uh, charts by hand that, uh, at, at Manhattan Fund, we had three by three foot loose leaf notebooks. And uh, each of those notebooks for every, every stock in the portfolio had a one point point for your chart, a three point point for your chart, a daily chart, and a weekly chart. That was it. And they were all done by hand because that's wow. the only way you could do them. And so you would keep all, individual. We all, we all subscribed to Trendline, which was the daily basis stock chart, uh, stock chart service. Subscribed to Mansfield, which was the weekly charts. And uh, that's what we had. That, uh, talk to the old time uh, technicians, and you'll find that <laughs> we we all got our trend lines sent out special delivery, uh, so we could get them on Saturday morning, so we could look at them over the weekend before we went in on Monday. Wow, that's amazing! And and for indicators, like, would you calculate those yourself too? Yep, calculate them yourself. Wow, we had at, at, at Manhattan Fund, you know. We, 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 were doing, we were doing sector analysis back in the 60s. Uh, we had a, 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 growth, a growth stock average. And we used to plot the Dow Jones and the growth average hourly. We did our own charts hourly back in the late 60s. Wow. And what happened is that uh, the uh, people who worked for me had a big kitchen timer and they set it to go off every hour. Every hour they hit the quote machine and the list of the seven, the nine stocks in the growth average would come out. They would calculate it and plot it. That's how what we did it. What happens if you're out to lunch or something? Uh, we don't, we don't go out to lunch when you, somebody was always there. <laughs> Someone was always there to make the chart. I love it. Somebody was always there to, to punch the quote machine. There's probably something to be said too about being that intimate with the data. You know, you're, you're calculating it yourself. You're really, really watching price and studying it uh, more than if I just, you know, type in a ticker um, on my charting platform. It's it's probably a little different, no? I think that's why that's why I admire Helene Meisler so much because she keeps charts by hand because there is a big difference between watching them flash by on a screen and actually putting your pencil down on a piece of paper and drawing in the high, low flows in the volume because you're actually thinking about it for five or six seconds, whereas on the screen it just flashes by. Uh, I would. I hate to sound like an old fashioned person, but <laughs> I would I would suggest everybody keep a couple of charts by hand, whatever bellwether stock or whatever bellwether news, but keep it by hand every day. I might, I might try that. Uh, but, you know, on the flip side, I will say one thing that's got me so bullish on technicals as a discipline and a way of looking at markets is the fact that we have charting platforms where we can rip through a thousand charts just like that. I think, um, you know, hopefully that really gets people to start looking at the market that way. But anyways, I want to talk about your time with Jerry Sai at the Manhattan Fund. Jerry Sai was a legendary mutual fund manager. He was very prominent during the go-go years. In fact, he's been called the Pied Piper of the go-go years. So could you tell us a little bit more about him and kind of the rise and fall of uh, Gerald Sy? Well, he ran, he, uh, he came out of Fidelity uh, in Boston, uh, which was a very aggressive uh, mutual fund manager back in the day. Uh, and he ran the Fidelity Capital Fund, which has really good performance. And that uh, he thought that when the first Mr. Johnson retired, that he wanted to run Fidelity. and. The first Mr. Johnson said, no, my son Ned is going to run Fidelity. And Jerry says, OK, I'm going to leave. So he went to New York and formed his own company, uh, raised $270 million, which was a record offering for a mutual fund back in those days. 
uh, and aggressive, very, uh, invested very aggressively. And it, uh, he, uh, uh, he ran, well, let me go, contrary opinion for him in 1966. I'm just starting there uh, you know, at, at, at Manhattan Fund. I'm very young, I'm very wet behind the ears. And the Mr. Johnson from Fidelity was the speaker. And I asked if Jerry would write me a letter of introduction. And he said, sure. And so he did. And I, after Mr. Johnson uh, gave his talk, a bunch of people went up to see him afterwards. Uh, and and uh, I'll never forget one of the questions that somebody asked him, Mr. Johnson, was Mr. Johnson with you know seven or eight different mutual funds how do you keep everybody on the same page? And Mr. Johnson said, and I quote, we run fidelity to as close to a complete state of anarchy as possible, which is exactly how Jerry ran uh, Manhattan Fund. So one day that the, the number two manager, uh, uh, money manager there was a guy named Bob Evers, who was a, a, a much better investor than Jerry was, but that's another story. Um, People used to come in, they, they, people had story stocks, and Bob would sit there and try to poke holes in it. You know, and he was, you know, he could poke holes in just about everything, but if he was unsuccessful, he went out and bought the stock. So he was sitting uh, in the board boardroom, uh, where I, right next to where I have my office. I was basically Jerry's eyes and ears on the market. And uh, one day he looks at me and says, it looks like uh, they're going to put a block of burrows on. I think I'll buy some. So he picks up the phone and calls the trading desk and says, it looks like somebody's going to put up a block of burrows. I'd like to buy 10,000 shares on the cleanup. And the trader says, well, you're right. So there is a block of burrows going up, but you can't buy it. It's Jerry's block. <laughs> and Bob puts the phone down and says, what's he know that I don't know? There was not a lot of sharing of information. And <laughs> one day, one of the income managers, uh, Charlie Bluedorn, who, who uh, ran Gulf and Western, which was one of, one of the more aggressive conglomerates back in the day, uh, came in and he told Jerry, he says, I am going to announce in the next month, I am going to announce three acquisitions that are going to knock your socks off because every one of the companies is a member of the Dow Jones Industrial Average. And Jerry put every fund in the place uh, into, uh, into a 5% position in Gulf and Western, right, 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 right. Then, which is, you couldn't have more than a 5% position. And yeah, the income guy comes back, finds out he's now got a 5% position in Gulf and Western. He says, couldn't he have at least have bought one of the convertible preferred so I get some income out of it? Uh, uh, by the way, both, that was the peak in Gulf and Western. And they never acquired anybody. And Jerry was, he was very technical, right? And, and do you think that was one thing that helped him succeed at least for a little while during that period? Um, because, you know, in a period where speculative fever is kind of driving prices momentum, right? Technicals will help you a lot more than fundamentals, right? Precisely. He was very big into technicals. He had, there were three technical uh, analysts working for him. And I think there were like four or five fundamental analysts. So that, that was a tremendous technician to fundamental ratio. Yeah. And, uh, uh, and so he was very much involved in technical analysis. So Walter, to kind of bring it all full circle here, um, if you were to nail down some of the biggest takeaways that investors should learn from this period, you know, if you're like myself and you weren't there during this period, but you'd still like to learn from the lessons and, and some of the, uh, mistakes that people might have made then, what are some of the biggest takeaways that you would tell investors from the go-go years and the boom and bust of the nifty 50 stocks? Well, unfortunately, Patrick, the, the, the lessons have already been learned. The, the lessons from the go-go years are, you know, there, there are, is a limit to uh, how much you should pay for the most exciting growth companies, uh, story stocks in the world. And that was, you know, ARC learned that lesson. Uh, and the lesson from the uh, uh, Nifty 50 was there's a limit to how much you pay for the best companies in the world with the most exciting earnings growth. And we learned that one in the FANG stock. So uh, now what we do is, you know, I think the more interesting thing is um, 
leadership usually changes during a bear market and what leads the old bull market doesn't usually need the new one. So uh, the question before the house is where's the new leadership? I don't I, know. I, I think read, that point. That's is, why I read the chart report every day because you're pointing out people who are looking for this new leadership. I, I think that point is so worth reiterating. In fact, I actually mentioned it to someone. I was like, you know, Walter said something to me the other day that really stuck with me new bull markets usually feature new leaders. So, you know, should we be looking to the old FANG stocks to be leading us out of this one? Maybe not, right? No, because uh, I remember in, in, in the 1970 decline that uh, Putnam was big on something called beta. You know, if, if you wanted how to perform the market, you wanted beta. So, you know, people were buying some of these speculative stocks that were high beta stocks, and Putnam was, you know, piling into stuff like iTech. And iTech had a, like a 50% recovery and then went dead. And the problem was that there was something else to consider called alpha. <laughs> and we decided that alpha was probably a little more important to look at than beta. Yeah, so, and another, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Another point that you uh, have definitely talked about in relation to this period is that the stock and the company are not the same thing. And I think you know, we've seen that in the last couple of years, but it seems like people forget all the time. You know, when you talk to people who aren't technicians, they'll talk about a company like Facebook and or something like that. Any any of them. Let's take Apple, for example, and say, oh, you know, Apple's doing great things. Their, their iPhone sales are this, that, yada, yada, yada. But, you know, sure, that all might be true. But but there's a difference between the company and what it's trading at and, you um, and, and, you know, what their business activities are. And it kind of all comes down to, you know, your, your quote, when the time comes to buy, you won't want to. And, you know, it might be a great company, but is it a great price, right? Right. Well, the, the thing is, see, I, 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 grew up, I grew up working for money managers. If I had grown up working, working for Warren Buffett, who buys companies, I would have an entirely different outlook on life. But I don't. So the thing is that what we're all doing is we're all buying stocks, which is, you know, in the old days, it used to be a little piece of paper. And the reason you bought this little piece of paper was you wanted to sell it to somebody at a higher price. You know, why it was at a higher price, you did not know necessarily, nor did you really care, perhaps, because you wanted the higher price. So the whole name of the game is didn't matter what the company did. You wanted to sell that little piece of paper, that stock to somebody else at a higher price. Right. That's all. It, it was kind of the greater fool kind of theory, right? Oh, not, not a greater fool theory so much. It's just the, uh, um, uh, the, 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 the fact that you know, you're, you're buying a stock, not, not a company. You, you, when, you, when you buy, when you buy uh, I don't know, uh, you know, Amazon, you know, you're not buying part of the company. You, know, you don't own part of Amazon. You own a little piece of paper that represents part ownership of Amazon. And what you want to do is sell that little piece of paper, which is now probably electrons in a server somewhere. You want to sell it to somebody at a higher price. And so, you know, the, 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 you know, whatever, you know, whatever the company does doesn't benefit you is you know, what benefits you is, is if the stock goes up or down. And the stock may go up or down. For reasons entirely different for what for what Amazon or anybody else is doing. So you know, the, going back to McDonald's and it, uh, as I say, you look up, you can look this up on uh, on uh, the Kindle preview. You can see the chart for free. You don't even have to shell out the money for the book. Uh, you, you can see that the earnings were going up constantly through the 1970s, and the stock was going nowhere. So the thing is, if you were right about the company, you were still wrong about the price of the stock. Uh, you know, I like to, you know, one thing I might say, if you tell me everything I want to know about Tesla over the next five years, you know, any question that I need to, to, to know about Tesla over the next five years, uh, I can, still can't tell you whether the stock is going up or down. Yeah. No, I think these are all really, really important lessons. Um, and, you know, Walter, I could sit here and pick your brain for hours, but I think we got to wrap it up. 
But before you go, where can our viewers find more of your work if they're interested? I know you mentioned uh, DeemerMarketMemos.com. We'll put that up. Um, but also, you know, you're very active on Twitter. Why don't you talk about that? Yes. Well, and in, in, when I retired, the, the, the thing was I stayed off when I was working. I stayed off social media because the people I work for manage billions and billions of dollars. And they're the biggest chief, chief, cheapskates in the world. So if they found out they could get a whiff of what I was thinking for free on social media. They wouldn't pay me and I would starve to death. Yeah. So I stayed off. And then when I retired, I decided to get on. Uh, Twitter, and uh, as I said in, in, at the end of my uh, book, you know, what I do now is I maintain an impish presence on Twitter. Now, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the market's going to do. That's why I retired. I have no idea, but it's sort of like a sportscaster watching a football game. You know, I don't care who wins. I want to point out interesting things on the field and point them out that things may, you know, be a lot different than they were back in the 60s and 70s. So I could go back to the market had the big uh, reversal a couple of weeks ago. I went back and I said, to me, the biggest reversal I can think of uh, was the one on May 29th of 1962. And somebody put out a, uh, a thing and said, we've done all the big inter intraday, intraday reversals. And that one was the biggest. So, but I just remember because I was sitting in the boardroom watching that thing. It was a very emotional time. I learned more in the last week of May in that boardroom than I did in four years at Penn State. Wow. Well, listen, Walter, this was a real treat. Thank you again for coming on. And, and by the way, best of luck to your, uh, to your team this weekend, Penn State. Oh, thank you very much. I think it's going to be a little tough. But as long as we don't do things like hitting people out of bounds like your team did last week. <laughs> oh, come on. Yeah, listen, no. Uh, what are they? Six, Syracuse is six and one now, though. I'll take it. You know, I haven't seen that good of a record from them in, in quite some time. So I'm, I'm happy with it. But anyways, well, as you can cut this out of the report. But I, when I went to Penn State, you didn't have to pay to go to the football games. And I was sitting on about the five yard line in the student section when Syracuse played Penn State. And Ernie Davis, one of the greatest football players ever, uh, was the star for Syracuse. Syracuse has the ball first and goal on the five-yard line. They give the ball to Ernie Davis. He gets three yards. They give it to him a second time. He gets one yard. Now they're on the one-yard line. Gives it to him a third time. Half a yard. He's on the half yard. Gives it to him a fourth time. Stopped. It was very dramatic, and I was there. I'm, I'm sorry. Syracuse probably won in the end because they usually did. Oh, that was a different era. I mean, Ernie Davis... He was one of the legends. They, they actually made a movie about him called The Express. But anyways, Walter, thank you so much for joining us. I hope to do it again sometime. Well, I'd like to. And thanks for publishing the chart report because you're exposing you know, a lot of people like me to a lot of good ideas, some from people we know of and some, importantly, from people we're just meeting through you. So thank you, Patrick. Of course. I, I love what I do. But uh, yeah, have a great weekend. Thanks. Thanks. Well, thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to click like and subscribe, and we'll see you again next week.